Hi, I'm Gareth Green and welcome to another video in our series of Inside the Mind of Beethoven, where we're looking at different aspects of Beethoven's style, how it's revealed through his music, where it might have come from, what does it achieve, what does that tell us about Beethoven, what does it tell us about composing that might be useful to us in a totally different way, different style, different age, lots of different dimensions on it. Well, in this video, we're looking at the very famous Moonlight Sonata, first movement of Beethoven. Wondering why this piece is so popular. Lots of people, if they know a Beethoven sonata, will cite this one. Lots of pianists who, even if they've never played another Beethoven sonata, they may well have come across this one and had a go at playing this one. They may even have come across a simplified version of it in a slightly easier key. But what is it that makes this piece so iconic, so popular? Well, it's a piece that Beethoven wrote. We think it wasn't commissioned. He dedicated it to one of his students at the time, but he finished writing it in 1801. So he's in his early thirties when he's written this piece. And the title Moonlight is not a title that Beethoven gave it. It's a title that kind of came via a critic who was reviewing the piece uh, after it was written but the title is stuck. It's slightly unusual, this first movement, because often you expect in a piano sonata um, that the first movement is gonna be a fast movement. So if you're gonna have an adagio, you kind of normally expect that to come as the second movement. This sonata is organized rather differently. So you're starting off with this slow movement. And just to remind ourselves, if we need reminding, what does it sound like? and so on. It's a tune we all know and love, isn't it? So what's going on here? Well, one thing that can make this sound very tedious in performance, I think, is when people play it a bit too slowly. People play it at lots of different speeds. But one thing you might find of interest in looking at this piece is actually this time signature, which is not telling us that the piece is in 4-4 four, four time, but telling us it's in 2-2 two, two time. So if you play it slowly, it does sound like 1, 2, 3, 4. Phew, the second bell's arrived. 2, 3, 4. Ah, oh, the third bell's arrived and I've lost the will to live. So it can be given the kiss of death in performance, even though it's such a famous piece simply because people are thinking about those four beats in a bar. So what Beethoven is asking us to do is to think of it in two beats per bar, slow beats because it's adagio, um, but it makes all the difference in the world. Okay, well, we start off with this quite long introduction, don't we, before the main tune, the main theme comes in at this point. So let's see what Beethoven is up to. Well, he's got a fairly slow harmonic rhythm. In other words, the rate at which the the chords change is fairly slow. Let's have a look at the harmonic rhythm. We've got one chord running through the whole of the first bar. We've got one chord running through the whole of the second bar, which is not very far removed from the chord in the first bar. We'll look at this in a minute. Then in the third bar, he moves it on a bit. So we get one chord for the first half of the bar, a different chord for the second half of the bar, and then he repeats that uh, well, we get one chord on the first beat, which changes a bit on the second beat, and then we get another modification there. So you see what's happening? He's speeding up the harmonic rhythm on the approach to the first cadence. So one bar, one bar, two chords and a half bars there, and then changing on every one of those uh, quarter notes or crotchets in that bar until we arrive a cadence there, a tonic chord cadence. And this is a perfect cadence going from the dominant 
to the tonic. That's our first statement. It's the introduction, the four bar introduction. So how does this introduction work? Well, we've got the tonic chord of C sharp minor, so C sharp, E, G sharp, and the bass just sits on the tonic, doesn't do anything else. It's very simple, isn't it? And the right hand is also fairly simple in design because it's just taking the notes of that tonic chord and spelling them out and repeating them. So it's kind of a broken chord figure. So in that first bar, we have this kind of rather static feeling, don't we? It sets an atmosphere of peace and calm. It's PP, it's slow. And there's a kind of sense of expectation building from the outset, isn't it? It's kind of like, well, what's all this about then? You know, if you start with a dramatic allegro, you'll immediately be hit between the eyes with fast tempo, fast rhythm, some strongly stated theme. And here's Beethoven just kind of going over this chord. Right, where's it going next? Well, there's a lovely development in the second bar where we have this B in the left hand. Now, don't you think that's a beautiful chord? Well, what is it though? It's actually a tonic seventh chord in its last inversion. Let's think about that for a moment. The tonic chord of C sharp minor, C sharp, E, G sharp, put the seventh on, we get B. And of course he's put that B in the left hand, so it's a tonic seventh, a one seven chord, in its last inversion. And I think it's the most beautifully written moment, even though it's kind of not overcomplicated, just to start with this kind of neutral tonic chord, and then to say, oh, here's that seventh in the bass. It's rather lovely, isn't it? And even though the left hand is moving so slowly, it starts to have a kind of melodic design because then it moves on to the next note down in the scale at the beginning of the third bar. So we move on to this A at this point. And the right hand is now spelling out a chord of A major. So what's this? In the key of C sharp minor, it's a chord six, a submediant chord. So we've had chord one, we've got chord one in its last inversion, then we've got chord six. And I think that's a lovely moment as well. You start with this minor chord, which gets richer by adding the seventh. And then you hear this major chord, which suddenly the light comes on a bit there, doesn't it? And then we get this lovely touch in the second half of the third bar. We get a chord we're not expecting here. Now, what's this about? Oh, interesting, isn't it? D natural? Well, you might be looking at this chord thinking, well, this looks to me like a chord of D major. But why on earth would we have a chord of D major when we're in the key of C sharp minor? It doesn't make any sense. Has Beethoven lost the plot? Not quite. Because this is a Neapolitan chord. Okay, now let's think about this for a moment. A Neapolitan chord is a major chord built on the flattened supertonic. So the supertonic, the second degree of the scale. So we're in C sharp minor. The second degree of the scale is D sharp. So if we lower that D sharp to D natural and build a major chord on it, we get a chord of D major. So it's not that he's modulated to D major, nothing like that. He's using this chromatic chord rather ingeniously. Uh, so it's a wonderful turn of the harmonic color, isn't it? That we get this tonic chord at the beginning, then it becomes the tonic seventh in last inversion. And then we go to chord six, a major chord where the light suddenly turns on. And then we have this rather dramatic Neapolitan chord, which is also, of course, another major chord. And then you think, where's he going from here? Well, he uses the F sharp as a little bit of a pivot onto the next chord, because then this chord is a dominant seventh back in C sharp minor. So we get a dominant seventh, and a dominant seventh needs to resolve. So it moves on to the tonic chord when we come to the second beat of this bar, but we've still got the G sharp going because G sharp is the root of the five seven chord. And it's also the fifth of this one chord. So it becomes a chord one in second inversion. And then you think, okay, well, what is he gonna do now? He's gonna have a cadence. So he's gonna go five, seven, one in C sharp minor. He almost does that, but he tucks in a suspension 
suspension. Have a look at that little C sharp in the right hand that's just tucked in the middle of this. Hear that C sharp? And then it becomes B sharp. So that C sharp is a suspension. It's what we call a 4-3 suspension. It's prepared here, it's sounded here, it's resolved there. And it's a 4-3 suspension. And it's just another little crunch that adds something to that cadence. So the 5-7, one in second inversion, and then a 4-3 suspension onto a 5-7 again, which prepares us for the return to the tonic chord. So I'm gonna suggest, even in the four bars of introduction, there's something absolutely wonderful going on. You've almost got this hypnotic thing that's being set up in the right hand with these triplets, just very simply, um, kind of breaking up the chords, but then you've got this wonderful kind of chord evolution going on and this sense of the left hand doing something a little bit melodic. It's not the strongest melody in the world, but it's clearly a bass line, but it has its own melodic life too. And this idea of minor chords and major chords, then inserting that Neapolitan chord, and then having this faster moving harmonic rhythm here uh, that also involves a 4-3 suspension. I mean, already we're in love with the piece by the time we get to the end of the fourth bar. And then we come into this bar when he comes back to the tonic chord. So that's all tonic chord again, broken up. And then he floats this melody over the top. And we're dying to hear a melody by this point, because we've had our four bars of introduction at this Dargio tempo. And now we're waiting for a really beautiful melody. What do we get when this melody starts? I think this is a wonderfully written melody. Just have a listen to the opening of the melody. Now, I think if a composition student of mine came along and said, hey, I've had this fantastic idea. I think this is really going to kind of set the world alight. Uh, here's my idea. I think I'd be saying, well, that's great, but maybe it needs to kind of do a bit more, like use more than one note. Here's Beethoven, the genius of Beethoven. How do you just repeat one note and make it sound as if it's an interesting melody. Goodness me, well, how does he do that? Well, first of all, it's got a distinctive rhythm, isn't it? This, this idea of this dotted rhythm. It's kind of nothing like the triplets that we've been kind of got, got used to in the opening bars. So that makes it quite a distinctive thing. It's kind of like the bell is tolling over everything else as well, isn't it? And what does he do with that melody? He sticks it on top of the pre-existing texture. And at the same time, the left hand just thickens out a bit. So when we get to this point, you notice how the left hand is now a little bit thicker than it was before. We've got three notes down there, not just the octave. And all of this is a tonic chord. So he's gone back to kind of that slow, expansive harmonic rhythm again of one chord taking up the whole bar, the whole measure. And then just at the end of it, he just floats the opening two notes of this melody. That dotted rhythm is so distinctive. Imagine if he hadn't put that dotted rhythm in, it would have gone like this. Doesn't have the same impact. The dotted rhythm amazingly makes a huge impact. Isn't that wonderful? And of course, then what happens? We've got this repeated G sharp, so we're already thinking, goodness me, is this going to be the most boring melody in history? But of course, it's how it interacts with what's happening harmonically. Because when we come to this bar, we're dealing with a dominant seventh chord, all right? So we've got G sharp, B sharp, D sharp, F sharp. And G sharp is a common note with the previous tonic note tonic chord and this dominant chord. So G sharp's in chord one and it's in chord five. So he can afford to repeat that G sharp as a common note, 
but the chord changes. And that's another touch of magic. How do you get away with repeating those notes? Well, you're not really getting away with it entirely melodically, but you're making that very distinctive statement with the rhythm, with that dotted rhythm. And by changing the chord, so you've got a, a common note between two chords, you get a different kind of color altogether, don't you? So have a listen to that again from here and you'll see and hear what I mean. that a wonderful impact just changing the chord and then he does that tolling rhythm again and comes back to chord one so you're thinking well why just come back to chord one well then the melody takes off Beethoven knows that he can't repeat this anymore we've had this G sharp one two three four five six times well, six is possibly your limit. So then he allows the melody to move out. So he abandons the dotted thing, which has given it all its character at the beginning of this melody. And then we go out into longer notes. So the rhythm becomes less distinctive as we go through the rest of the phrase, but he's then going to evolve the melody a bit. So from this point, the last of the repeated G sharps, well, we're going up a note to A, we're coming back to G sharp, going down a note to F sharp, and then we're ending with two leaps. So having had this repeated note, everything going by step, we leap up a fourth. It seems like a huge leap after all that repetition and stepwise movement. And then this massive descent by a fifth into the cadence. So those leaps at the end are kind of in the context of the melody, Absolutely, they, they sound huge, even though they're not really going up a fourth down a fifth, just in the context they do. And of course, there's another clever thing he does, because when he comes to his first cadence at the end of the first melodic statement, um, he's in a different key because he's modulated to E major. So if we go from here, let's see what happens. We've got C sharp minor, so that's called one in the C sharp minor key that we're in. Then he goes to F sharp minor. Okay, well, F sharp minor is called four in C sharp minor, but it's also called two in E major. So he uses that as a pivot chord. And then he has this bold cadence in the relative major key where he goes one in second inversion. Then he goes five, seven to the end of the bar and then settles in. E major, the relative major key. So that lift into the relative major key is another kind of wonderful device that he does there. Okay, let's go on for a moment and see what he does next. So we're already kind of, you see what's drawing us into the music, the way he's got these various ingredients and we're kind of shifting the emphasis from one to another. And then we think, okay, we're in E major, so maybe now he's going to have a a little bit in E major. I mean, you know, he could kind of go to E major and then he could say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll rerun this in E major. And we could do that. Well, that'd be kind of obvious thing to do. Does Beethoven do that? No, he doesn't. He's in E major here. And then he takes us by surprise by saying, how about we just switch to chord one in the parallel minor? So he goes to a chord of E minor. It's the last thing you're expecting. So have a listen again from here. Hear the cadence in E major and then hear the impact of this E minor chord. Whoa, isn't that a wonderful moment? It's really dramatic, isn't it? Hearing that. G sharp going to a G natural. Uh, so it absolutely grabs you, doesn't it? So now he's grabbed us harmonically by doing something and we're thinking, oh, right. So it's a sonata in C sharp minor. He's modulated to the relative major, E major. Yeah, we understand why that might happen. But suddenly now we're in E minor, are we? Well, let's see what happens because he's in E minor at this point. Okay, here's E minor. We're getting over the shock of that by repeating it. And then comes the melody again. But this time, of course, we're repeating G naturals. And then he says, just as we're thinking, well, surely we're now going to be using a chord in E minor. He says, if I'm going to repeat this G as a common note, I've got to find another chord that G natural belongs to. And he says, well, let's be a bit adventurous and use this chord. Oh, 
lovely chord, isn't it? Isn't that a lovely moment? Well, what is that chord? It's a dominant seventh in the key of C, if you don't mind. So having used the E minor chord, which is a kind of borrowed chord from the parallel minor, we were in E major, so we borrowed one from E minor. It then says, well, yeah, that's true, but E minor is chord three in the key of C major. So now I'm gonna use chord five, seven in second inversion. Whoa. And we've got this stepwise movement in the bass that we had up there as well. So he's pulling that thread together. And then from there, of course, this dominant seventh in C major needs to resolve to a tonic chord in C major. So you think, all right, so we're now in C major, are we? All right, okay. But then immediately after, oh, we're back with an E minor chord, strange. And then we get this on the third beat of that bar. So you're thinking, oh, so we've still got the G sounding in the melody and we've got all this stuff going as well. Well, that's a diminished seventh chord, isn't it? Oh my goodness. So we've got a diminished seventh chord and then a dominant seventh in the key of B. The key of B? Uh, could be B major, could be B minor. Oh, where are we going? So then he says in the next bar, well, let's resolve that onto a tonic chord of B minor. So B minor. Oh, ah, okay. And then he says, well, here's E minor again. Are we going back to E minor? Well, no, we're not, especially with that C sharp in it. So it's a chord 2-7, isn't it, in B minor. 2-7 in first inversion, going to 2-7 in second inversion. And then he does the classic 1-C-5-1 cadence, but in B minor. 1, second inversion, 5 and then one in B minor. So you, then you're thinking, okay, well, we're now in B minor, are we? And then of course, as soon as he's established that B minor cadence, what does he do? Introduces a D sharp and throws us into B major. So remember that earlier bit where we were in E major and we got thrown into E minor? Well, now we're doing it the other way around. We're in B minor and we're being thrown into B major. So B minor. B major, and then he goes C natural, stick that in your pipe and smoke it. It's kind of like, whoa, what's that doing there? And it's becoming increasingly more dissonant. Okay, well, we could go on about this movement all day, but can you begin to see some of the threads that make this a really engaging piece? These are the things that engage us when we're hearing the piece and need to engage us when we're performing the piece as well. And so many clever touches going on in little bits of use of the rhythm, the kind of hypnosis of the repeated triplets, the very distinctive dotted rhythms of that melody, that idea of repeated notes in the melody, and then how that evolves into something a bit more sustained, a bit more cantabile, how we get all these fascinating things going on harmonically, and how this whole kind of key thing and use of chromatic chords and unexpected harmonic changes is starting to evolve even further. So the moment we've got to there is the moment of greatest dissonance so far, you know, and you wonder where on earth it's going next. So the whole piece, the whole movement continually draws you forwards. So, okay, it's got a memorable tune. That's probably what most people would say is iconic about it. But actually, I think the reason why this is such a popular piece is that Beethoven engages us on so many different levels in terms of what's happening with the melody, what's happening with the, with the rhythmic design of it, what's happening harmonically, and all of this in the kind of gravitas of this adagio. Very skillfully written piece, but intensely memorable and emotionally entirely engaging. Well, if you've enjoyed this video and you want to go a little bit deeper with Beethoven, you might want to go to our website, www.mmcourses.co.uk. When you click on courses, you'll find there's analysis there. And one of the things that we've tackled on our analysis courses is a real in-depth analysis of Beethoven's Pathétique Piano Sonata. All the movements, looking at it from a melodic, rhythmic, harmonic, key perspectives, as well as exploring textures 
and structures and all the rest of it. So if you really want to go deeper with this, you might want to follow that course uh, and see where that takes you in understanding Beethoven and just kind of digging underneath the surface uh, to explore the power of his music. Lots of other courses on the website that may be of interest to you as well on theory, oral development, analysis, orchestration, all sorts of things out there. Have a look, see what there might be for you. Also click on Maestros while you're there because you might be interested in joining Maestros. Level one is kind of basically uh, helping to support the channel, but it comes with perks. Level two gives you many more perks, including access to a monthly teaching live stream where I kind of do this kind of thing in much more detail for an hour a month. You can come and join that. You can ask questions on the live chat, be part of our international community. If you're a composer, well, join the level three group. Or if you're a performer, join the Level 3 group where you can submit recordings of your own performance, you can submit scores of your own compositions and you get one-to-one -one evaluation from me there. We share the work with each other and there's a live chat running there. Everybody's saying how marvellous it is to be part of this supportive global community, everybody else on the same kind of journey and how much we learn from each other. So that may be a rich resource for you. Enjoy.